writer by the name of Philip Bliss. He used to be the song leader for Dwight Moody in Michigan, in, uh, yes, in Detroit, in uh, Chicago, Illinois. And uh, he had relatives in New York where they spent a Christmas one time. And uh, on their way home, he and Lucy in the train, it, uh, the trestle broke as the train went across. Philip had a marvelous voice. He could sing the deepest bass to the highest tenor. And he would write hymns, words, and music and sing them at uh, Dwight Moody's Crusades. But the train crashed into the river below. It caught on fire. Uh, Philip was thrown out of the train. He got back inside trying to find his wife, and they both perished. But he left the legacy not only of those hymns that he had written and were already in many hymnals, but they found his briefcase. And in his briefcase were a number of hymns that he had written, the words and the music. And so those hymns are, uh, found their way into the hymnals as well. A wonderful legacy. It reminded me of one of his songs this evening that we were singing. OK, I think we're ready to stop talking and uh, get on with our meeting. I still see people filling these out. I don't want to start talking until you're done filling your papers out. Because you won't be listening if you're filling your papers out. I'm an old teacher. Forgive me for that. Now, the title this evening, The Longest Time Prophecy in the Bible. I promise you it won't be the longest sermon. Or we could title it, the Great Judgment Day. First, let's take a minute on the questions. I'm going to hurry through them because there's a lot of material to cover tonight. Why have the churches made up their own denominations and replaced the Jewish feasts is this why the millennium is needed? These are three separate questions. I've answered the first one already. Almost every Christian church that's ever gotten started, they define what their beliefs are. And then before long, somebody, maybe an elder, maybe a lay person, gets to thinking about the Bible and decides that the church isn't quite right on that topic. And he talks to a few friends. And they go to the church leaders, maybe, and the church leaders, and they say, no, what we had was correct. And those few people go off and do what? Start another church. I mentioned that about the Baptists. I love those people. There's over 350 Baptist denominations as a result of that kind of thing. So that's what happens just as the nature of mankind. As far as the feasts are concerned, uh, most of you are aware of the fact that the Lord gave the Israelites what are called feast days. The most famous one is Passover. There's the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Weeks and so forth. Uh, my belief is that at the cross, when Jesus died, those feasts which pointed forward to his death were no longer needed. I have friends who, if you will, keep those feasts, or when that day comes by, they have some kind of a service. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You might consider, however, that has become a divisive thing in Christianity. And any time there's something that comes up that seems divisive, I think it would be wise to lay it aside if you want to, in your own way, do something. But it has become quite divisive in, in not just one denomination. So that would be my counsel if I were your pastor. Uh, and then why the millennium is needed, I really covered that last evening, but I'll make this comment. The Bible does not say exactly what the millennium is for, except that the first resurrection and the second resurrection would occur before and after it. It's somewhat obvious from the Bible story, because the devil and all the angels that fell from heaven with him, they were, they were righteous angels, and they chose to follow the devil. The Bible says about a third of them. That's a lot. They will be roaming this desolated earth, 
They will be bound here, it says in Revelation 20, that, that Satan is bound with a chain. It's, it's a metaphor for the fact that he cannot go anywhere in the universe except on this earth for a thousand years. I don't know if those imps will fight with each other. I wouldn't be surprised. Evil, you know, people that have an evil heart tend to fight with each other. Isn't that correct? It takes God's grace to keep that. But nevertheless, uh, the Bible doesn't say exactly, but that's what is described as taking place. Now, this uh, question, or it's kind of a statement, when a man dips his, dipped your, the, the request in, in uh, Luke 16 was uh, from the rich man to Abraham. Now, this, is, this whole thing is a metaphor. It does not teach what's happening after death, but uh, Paul told this story uh, for a reason, uh, to teach something, and I'll get to that in just a second. But after death, the rich man is in hell. Lazarus the beggar is in Abraham's bosom, it says in the parabolic story, this, per this, this uh, parable. And uh, the rich man is burning in the fire, and he asks the beggar to give him a drop of water on his tongue because he's so hot. If there was anything in the whole parable t that tells you it's a parable and not trying to teach something about what happens in hell, that would be enough. But there's a whole list of things, folks, in that story that make it clear that it's trying to teach something. And that teaching comes at the end when the uh, rich man, who's still burning in the flames, says to Abraham, tell my brothers so they won't end up here. And Abraham sends to him, if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe if someone is raised from the dead. So this is a lesson about believing Bible truth and not assuming that uh, we know better. And folks, there's only one way to do that. God has ordained that people teach. But in the end, folks, it's your, it's your reading of this book and your commitment to God, whether you say it out loud or not, that's when he promises to lead you into truth. And you submit yourself. You say, Lord, it doesn't matter what it is. Show me what you want me to understand. And uh, I encourage, in spite of the fact that I'm up here sharing my understanding, folks, your responsibility is to go to those same passages all through the Bible and let the Lord teach you. If one dies before they are baptized, are they lost? Uh, the, the, the thief on the cross is a good example. He couldn't come down from the cross and get baptized. But God wants us to have that experience. You know this, folks. The water does not wash away any sins. Is that correct? It's a symbol, but it's a powerful symbol. And whether or not you thought it was, Jesus said, I'm supposed to do that. Is that correct? And so my encouragement for you is... Uh, to make that decision. And if you haven't been baptized, the church family here will arrange that for you and you need to let them know. Talk to the pastor or even put it on your card as I have suggested. Are we condemned if we happen to kill another in self-defense? Uh, I think the answer is clearly no. There are some people, and I'm not saying you should do this, who say, I'm not gonna try to kill anybody that's killing me. I'm gonna let God take care of things. And, uh, I think that the choice is yours, but the principle there is that one can defend him or herself. Should we pray aloud? Lots of examples in the Bible. Jesus prayed aloud, and when the disciples heard him praying, they were so moved that they went to him and they said, teach us to pray. And so we have the Lord's Prayer. But that is not the ultimate teaching necessarily. Jesus was trying to help them understand the kinds of things that we speak to the Lord about. So if you never said the Lord's Prayer, if you will, what's called the Lord's Prayer, that's all right. It, it's teaching us something about asking and thanking and so forth. Daniel prayed out loud. It cost him a stay with the lions. Um, I love that story because he spent the, the night sleeping on a vibrating pillow. Are you all with me? Very comfortable. Very comfortable. 
the king couldn't sleep. All night long, he couldn't sleep. But I love that story for another, what am I doing getting sidetracked here? I, I love that story for another reason. The king loved Daniel. It was just beautiful. He comes rushing out there in the morning. I guess the rule was that if they made it through the night, they could come out. And he loved Daniel. Daniel, are you, did your Lord, did the angel save you? You know, the king was becoming a believer, wasn't he? That the, and, and Daniel said, yeah, he did. He really did. <laughs> the Lord has sent his angel and has stopped the lion's mouth. All right. Uh, there's some other examples of praying out loud. I think you should pray out loud. When I'm praying, and I have a long prayer list, I would encourage you to have a prayer list, friends. As a pastor, part of the prayer list was every member in the church. And I would pray. I probably know more about each of those families than anybody else does. And so I have something really to pray about. And by the way, when you, when you minister to people, and you're supposed to, you, you'll get material to pray about. Is that correct? And uh, I'm praying through that list, and I'm just, so I was sitting here this evening praying for three or four of you in this room that I have this heavy heart for. And uh, I never get clear through the list, and I either make a mark in my mind or I put a check on that list, and then, and the next time I'm there, I'm, I'm in my office, and I'm on my knees, I'm, I go on down some more. You should do that kind of thing. It's a great blessing, friend, to pray. And most of the time, I pray out loud. There's nobody around. And uh, I was sitting here praying very quietly out loud. So I think it's a good idea. It helps. You, you know what happens to me? My mind wanders when I'm praying silently. You ever have that happen? And praying out loud will help you. It will, it will deepen the impression on you to you hear yourself, you know, speaking to, to God. The curse of the law is that if you aren't forgiven, you will die. Is that clear? The law is there to be obeyed, but of course God offers to live in you and give you strength to do those things. Are we required to follow all 613 laws? I think this person is referring to, uh, most of you know this, but I'm going to just remind you or tell you if you don't. Moses came down from the mountain with a book he had written before the Ten Commandments were written. This is chapter 19 in Exodus. And uh, that book was full of rules that he read to the whole tribe of Israel. And they said something interesting. You know what they said? Most of you know. All that the Lord has said we will do. And they meant it, I'm sure. I don't know that as a fact, but I believe that. But they weren't able to do it. Before long, they were worshiping a golden calf that they had, of all things. And that's why the, in the New Testament, that agreement that the people made and said, we'll do it, that agreement is called the Old Agreement or the Old Covenant. And the New Covenant, which started in the Old Testament, it's interesting to me, folks, that so many Protestants misunderstand this. They believe that and it's, let me back up and say, it's strange that we call that half of the Bible the Old Testament. Testament and covenant are the same word. Right? When you have a marriage, you talk about a testament uh, between the two couples, between the two people. And uh, the idea that in the Old Testament, people were saved by works and that in the New Testament, or under the New Covenant, people are saved by grace, is completely false. You read Hebrews 11. You go right through the list of people. You have, uh, in the beginning, uh, Abel, Enoch, Abraham, Sarah, uh, Jacob, uh, Isaac. Uh, um, the next one in that list is... Um, no, dear, the next one after Jacob is. Anyway, everybody in that list was saved by what? And what time did they all live in? The Old Testament, friends. It's astonishing to me, I've said this before, how clear these things are, and yet this teaching is out there that people were saved by works there, but now they're saved by grace. Not so, folks. Everybody that ever will be saved or was saved was by grace through faith. And... Um, so this, this book, all these rules, I'm not even going to start mentioning some of them. 
mainly designed for the Israelites in their 40-year camping trip. Uh, all kinds of things. I won't even start. It's interesting to look at them, but it's not all that useful. So there are a few things from those that are quite obviously still wise. Peter, in the book of Acts, had a vision where there was this sheet full of unclean animals. Now, for some of you that aren't used to this term, it doesn't mean they had dirt all over them. Unclean meant animals that weren't fit to be food in the Old Testament, that is, for the Israelites. And clean animals is not that they were washed clean. They were animals that God said you could eat. Now, by the way, in the Garden of Eden, did they eat clean animals? No, all they ate was plants. The eating of, of animals, folks, <clears throat> I shouldn't tell you this, but tomorrow night I'm going to discuss with you how to, how to prevent dementia and get over diabetes or prevent it. And, and the main thing is to stop using animal foods. They're killing you. There is so much science behind that, folks, a person would be foolish to try to say it's not the case. Now, if you want to choose to do it, it's fine. That's up to you. But the science is so strong, folks. I, it, 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 it's amazing what's happening today in getting people well when they do the Garden of Eden diet. I'm going to talk to you about that tomorrow night. And, and in that situation, I'll take questions, and at the end, I'll do Q&A if you'd like, if you can stand it that long. Where was I? So Peter has this vision, and a voice says, and this sheet is full of unclean animals. A voice says, rise, Peter, and eat. And he says, I have never eaten anything unclean. Why did he say that? Because he understood that among the many things that the Israelites were taught there, mostly perhaps because of the way they were living and traveling with their church and all of that, uh, they were told they should not eat anything unclean. And Peter understood that that was still in effect. So we teach that because of that kind of thing. So you'll find certain uh, principles that were carried on into the New Testament, and you'll find them taught there. And that's one case where Peter said, I I've never done it. Uh, and actually, he was t told to do it three times. And he said, no, I've never done that. i got to quit this. The rest of the story is that God was illustrating to Peter that the Jewish people should be ministering to the non-Jews. And for a Jew, that was about the worst thing you could ever ask them to do. And God was saying, no, no, no. You are to be ministering to everybody. And knock, knock, knock on the door came some unclean people. Not that they were unwashed, you understand, but they were not Jews. And so the Jews considered them, if you will. All right, that was longer than I had planned to be sure. Is there a war happening as we speak in, this, uh, in the spiritual world? Yes, there certainly is. Uh, what is it? In, uh, I was going to tell you the chapter, but Ephesians 6. Uh, uh, there's this thing against principalities and powers in high places. Paul is talking about the evil angels. And there's a war between the evil angels and the, and the, and the righteous angels. So, yeah, the answer to this, all through the Bible, there are hints of this thing. When Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth, isn't this the, this the new world that God creates after the second resurrection? Absolutely it is. Will Satan feel everyone's pain at the end uh, of what he did? The Bible doesn't speak to that, but the implication is certainly there that he's going to suffer those thousand years for the mayhem that he caused in God's creation. All right. John 1, verse 29. The next day, John sees Jesus. Now, the writer is not that John. The writer is John the disciple. He is talking about John the Baptist. Are you all with me on this? He saw, uh, John saw Jesus coming. John was the one that was out there preaching. And remember, it says all the towns came out to hear this man preach. Um, and he saw Jesus. He had never seen him before, but it was revealed to him somehow by the Holy Spirit that this was Jesus Christ. And he, he made this amazing statement. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And this is when, of course, Jesus came. We studied this the other night, uh, to be baptized himself. But the question is, what was 
What was going on when John made this rather cryptic statement? Well, it had to do with what we might call the sacrificial system. Most of you are pretty familiar with this, but we're going to study it this evening in order to interpret this amazing Bible prophecy. Starting in the Garden of Eden, we don't have the details, but it's obvious that God had Adam and Eve take one of their lambs and kill it. Must have been a very hard thing to do. Because Adam and Eve, after they lost this robe of light, are you all with me? And they were ashamed and hiding because they were naked. God made them clothing out of what? Animal, animal skins. Where did they get those skins? They had to kill an animal. Now, there's not much detail about that record, but by the time the two boys were born, it's clear that uh, God had them offering sacrifices because Abel uh, brought a lamb, and the Bible doesn't say how God honored his sacrifice. That's all it says. But later in the Bible, there's many examples of God sending fire from heaven to, to, to destroy the sacrifice, and that's probably how God honored Abel's sacrifice. And Cain over here, listen, folks, this is very interesting. Instead of following God's instruction exactly, he decided to alter it somewhat. Do you and I ever, or are we ever tempted to do that? And when fire did not come down, or when his sacrifice, this is Cain, was not honored, his, the lovely things from his garden, is that an, isn't that a nice offering to God? The problem is that's not what God said to do. Is that correct, friends? We need to learn from these lessons. God means what he says. When he says this or that is what I want you to do, we should, we should decide to do that, accepting his power that we might. Does that sound like a familiar song, friends? And uh, Cain was angry, and he killed his brother. What a sad story. What a sad story. But as time went on, this was obviously part of God's plan. The next time you see it is with the Israelites, mainly. And uh, it's interesting when an artist draws a picture of this sanctuary that I drew here briefly last night. They show the tents close by. That's not the case. The tents were almost a third of a mile away. And every morning and evening, I'll talk about this in just a moment, when the services were occurred, the entire encampment stood at attention. A million people. And that was the reason for the space. And the other reason for the space is that uh, this was a symbol of the holiness of the sanctuary. Uh, so in any case, whether or not the artist's drawing is perfectly representative is not an issue. I want to review quickly with you the services that took place in that sanctuary. You can see different drawings. We don't know exactly how the thing looked. We do know there was this curtain around an area that is called the court in the Bible. And you saw uh, there's another drawing of the court with, the, with the, that, that white fence around there with the tents way, way too close. Um, and then this is a representation of part of the blood that's used, and I'll explain that to you briefly here. Um, but let me just finish. This curtain uh, surrounds an area that, and the curtain was too high. You could not see inside what was going on. The lesson there is, folks, you and I cannot see how God is working to forgive us. By faith, we believe that he does. Amen? And that was a symbol. You couldn't see inside. And uh, then there was the, uh, that was called the courtyard, the altar of burnt offerings. This is where the animals were killed and cut into pieces and burned. All kinds of rules involved there. I'm not going to try to begin to get into them. Uh, if you were poor, uh, you could bring, instead of a lamb, you could bring a dove. If you were really poor, you could bring a handful of grain. And that would be the sacrifice. And every time an animal, whether it was a, la a lamb or a dove or even some grain was offered, it was a symbol 
of one day when Christ would offer his life. And this is the reason, folks, when Christ offered his life, the sacrificial system was no longer needed. You all with me on this? It's very clear. Uh, you do not see in the New Testament people in the sacrificial system. Christ, Christ's offering took care of that whole thing once and for all. But it was at that altar where that was done. Before the priests went inside the sanctuary, they had to wash. That was a symbol of being forgiven. And in the sanctuary, uh, there were these two rooms called the holy place. And in that one, there was the candlestick and the table of bread and the altar of incense, which I mentioned to you last evening. Uh, and then after the veil was the most holy place, where was the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the amazing, uninteresting thing I should say about this is that we'll read this. This structure was a pattern of the tabernacle in heaven. And what was the Ark of the Covenant in the earthly sanctuary represented God's throne in the heavenly tabernacle, as it says in uh, Revelation chapter 13. It refers to the beast uh, that's behind us, behind the lady here, the beast uh, that uh, blasphemes his tabernacle, remember that, and those who live in heaven. Now, let me just quickly go through the, the services that took place. The veil is there because if the priest is in the holy place, if a priest is in there and he should see the ark, he would die because God's presence is there. So the veil is protecting him, and actually the veil represents Jesus Christ. There's also a veil at the other end uh, so that this very holy place, these holy places would not be easily seen by uh, just casual observance even of a priest. Now, here's the way the services went. Every morning, just at sunup, the high priest alone would go into the sanctuary and offer incense. The incense in the Bible has a special formula. And... Uh, I've told you already, most of you knew this. The smoke of the incense represents the fact that because I'm not worthy to talk to God, but because Jesus is worthy and his prayers can take my prayers and present them before the king of the universe. That's the meaning of the incense. And how does the incense smell? Sweet. Our prayers are, if, if your heart is open to God, friends, people pray every day in the form of cursing. Isn't that amazing? I mentioned that earlier. That prayer is not too sweet to God. But when you and I pray, asking for help or praising his name, uh, asking him to bless others. I was sitting there this evening. There's a woman I would like to see healed. I wish God would tell me to go to her house and put my hands on her and God would heal her. I really, I've really been asking him that all week long. Uh, he hasn't asked me to do that yet. Uh, that might be risky. Why might that be risky? I could get proud over that, right? I've been talking to him that, about that all week. I, I, I want him to help me be so emptied of self that it would be safe to do that. I believe God's going to do that as the end draws near with you and uh, anyone who wants to give their lives. I, I wish I could take a little more time, folks, on this self-issue. The real big issue in, in following Christ is I have to let him put self to death. You cannot do it. He will not do it unless you what? Ask him. I have found that self, self-resurrects. You know what I'm talking about? And when that happens, when you, be, when you become angry, folks, what has happened to self? It's very much alive. When you feel like you're better than somebody else, what's happened to self? It's very much alive. Uh, Jesus made of himself no reputation. 
Isn't that beautiful? And if I will let God do that for me, and, my, and myself, just, you can't believe, if, if I told you the things that pop into my mind about me, you'd just shake yourself, your head and say, what? Maybe some of you know what I'm talking about. But that's the real issue all week, folks. If you will let Jesus put self to death, he will use you to bless other people. And he will bless you. He will give you words to speak in season. Didn't I mention this text already? Isaiah 50, verse 4. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned, that I might know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. It's a beautiful plan, folks, that the Lord has for us. In any case, that's what the offering of incense was about. Every sun up and every sun down, the high priest alone was the only one who would offer incense. Very interesting. Then at 9 o'clock in the morning and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon was the daily sacrifice where an animal would be taken, slain by the priests, and offered on this, you can't see it in this slide, the, 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 offer, the, the altar of burnt offerings. And uh, those were done every day. Between those, if you had been there and done something wrong, this is amazing, folks. You had to come there with your lamb. And at that case, the, re, the suppliant, I'll call him or her, could go inside and place their hands on the hand of the lamb and confess their sins, and then the, the life of the lamb was taken. And the priest would catch, follow this carefully now, some of you are struggling to say, stay awake, and I'm so sorry that my droning voice puts you to sleep. But please, I don't want to be cute, folks. This is important stuff. Uh, the priest has a bowl. He catches some of the blood from the slit throat of the lamb. And then the priest takes that blood inside the sanctuary and smears it, sprinkles it on the altar of incense and on the veil. There's symbolism there, which is that your sin was forgiven, but the record of that sin, please watch this point, this is critical. The record of that sin is now on the veil in the form of some blood. Are you all with me on that? I suppose if you had to kill a lamb every time you got impatient, you might start thinking about learning how to be not impatient. Is that correct? And folks, spiritually, you, can, you and I can enter into that as we read these stories and try to grasp what this sacrificial system meant. That's one of the things the Bible is for, is to deepen into our hearts and minds God's wonderful plan to help you and me become more and more like Jesus. So those are the services, the incense, the morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice, the evening incense, and then, or during the day, individual confession and sacrifice, and then the evening uh, incense at sundown. Now, once a year, Yom Kippur, called in the Bible the Day of Atonement. Atonement means at one with God, at one meant. And the idea was they're going to get rid of the record of the sins of the people that are on the sprinkled on the altar and on the veil. Are you all with me on the idea? That's okay, dear. It's all right. Go ahead and help her with that if you would. <clears throat> That's okay. Don't, don't apologize. Um, in that service was to be so deepened upon the minds of the people that they spent three days preparing for it, physically washing, confessing their sins. It was so serious, folks, that if somebody had an unconfessed sin, when the high priest, and this is the only time in the whole year that anybody went into the most holy place, and it was, I say anybody, it was, it was only ever the high priest that would do that. He 
he would go in there with blood from a lamb sacrifice and actually put some of it on the altar with his finger. And if he had an unconfessed sin or if somebody in the camp did, he would die. They actually, the Bible doesn't teach this, but it's in Jewish tradition. He, he went in there with a rope tied around his ankle case he did die so they could take him out. There's no record of that ever having happened. It's interesting. You can imagine a million people. No unconfessed sin. This, folks, is a symbol of what's going to happen at the end of time so that God can take you and me to that better land. Aren't you wanting to be there? I want to be there with you. So this preparation, it was a time of judgment. Please notice that. And this is important because it symbolizes the judgment that is coming. And remember, that was the title of our, uh, of our talk this evening, that the time of judgment is coming, and we think it's coming very soon, as I'll show you. It was a time of thanksgiving. Everybody was forgiven. Now let's go back to the book of Daniel. He has a vision, folks, that's going to give us this prophecy. I'll just tell you up front, that's going to tell us how soon Jesus is coming. That's the point. Uh, and the reason it's called the longest time prophecy in the Bible is because it starts at Daniel's time and goes right up to the time when Jesus comes. No other prophecy spans that much time. That's where we got its title. I meant to read the first verse. In the third year of Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel. Uh, after the one I saw before. The one he saw before was these four animals that represented the four kingdoms. Now he gets another vision, and again it has some animals in it. Uh, last two, three lines, I saw in the vision, I was by the river, and I looked up, and third line, there was a ram. Two horns, they were high, but one was higher than the other. The higher one came up last, as though he could watch it grow. Um, and I'm just picturing that behind the verse there. Somebody drew a picture of it. Here's this ram with these two horns, and one was a little higher than the other. The ram which thou sawest, he is told by the angel, represents what? Medo-Persia. And because the uh, Persians became stronger than the Medes, because the Persians became stronger than the Medes, we see uh, the bear that represented Medo-Persia. Some of you can't see this, but one shoulder is higher than the other. That's the same idea. One horn is higher than the other. So Daniel is getting a picture of, of a little bit later because Babylon is gone. He's getting a picture with some different animals of the same history. Uh, I saw the ram pushing west and north and south. No beast could stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. This is talking doubtless about the Grecian, the, uh, Grecian kingdom, uh, the Medo-Persian kingdom, and shortly after that, as I was considering, a he-goat came along from the west and touched not the ground, and the goat had one notable horn between his eyes, so the, so the artist has drawn a picture of that. And you see Daniel at the bottom of the screen. He, he's seeing this as though it's really happening. It's a vision. And the, the, the goat came to the ram, which had the two horns, which I had seen standing there by the river, and ran into him with the fury of his power. And he was moved with ferocity against the ram and smote the ram and broke the two horns. And there's another drawing that sort of it, it shows what Daniel might have been, how it might have looked. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped on him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Then the Bible says, the ram which thou sawest was Medo-Persia, which we already knew, and the goat was the king of Greece, and the great horn was the first king. The goat is Grecia, and the great horn is the first king. Who was that? Alexander. Alexander the Great. Uh, prophesied before it ever happened. Therefore the goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken. Uh, Alexander uh, drunk himself to death. He was, I think, 33 or was it 38? Just before he died, he brought his four generals in 
and uh, instead of assigning which was which, this is the kind of a guy he was, he let them sort of fight it out. And uh, that's a history that I know a little bit about, but I'm not going to get into it this evening. Out of one of those horns, watch this, came a little horn. That's the same little horn, friend, friends, that we've talked about before. Out of one of those four generals that then uh, went to the four directions with their territories, uh, out of one of those came a, a little horn, which watch, this is why we know it's that. It waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the what? Speaking of Jerusalem and that area, if you will, it waxed even great to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Uh, I know this isn't easy for some of you to, to accept, but that's what the church did, folks. The church uh, slew 50 million people because they wouldn't follow what the church said they should. Is that correct? A very tragic story, but that's... Uh, the history of the thing, and that's what this is referring to. Cast them down and stamped upon them. Then I heard one saint speaking, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? That's a very strange verse that takes a lot of work, but it's referring to the fact that this, this spiritual battle is taking place, uh, and how long is this battle going to be there? And this is... You know, this is he, Daniel heard uh, a, a, an angel uh, saying this, and uh, the answer comes and says, "Unto two thousand three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed." It's very interesting. I'll just tell you where we're going with this. It's referring to the heavenly sanctuary, where a record. Follow me now a record of my sins and your sins is kept. The Bible speaks about several books. There's the book of life. Anytime anybody says to Jesus, I want to follow you, and they, they say what they, they're meaning this, I want to follow you, I want to be your child, or whatever words you use, your name, that name is written in the Lamb's book of life. It's called that in the book of Revelation. You are on the list to be saved. I hope everybody in this room has done that. Now, you can get your name blotted out. Revelation. About chapter 5. talks about, I will not, or chapter 4, I will not blot out your name out of the book of life. What does that mean? Your name could be blotted out. So, uh, 2,300, and then the sanctuary be cleansed. This prophecy, it will show us in a minute where it starts, tells us when the world will end because the last thing that Jesus will do before we are taken to heaven is to make sure that there's no record of sin there in the book. Do you know it says in another place in the New Testament that in the books where, you're, where my sins are recorded, I will, I'll quit talking about your sins. I'll just talk about mine. They can be blotted out. It says there, when the times of refreshing shall come. And uh, this cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary means that all of the sins of the people who are wanting to be saved will be blotted out of those books. So there is now no more record of sin in the heavenly sanctuary. You got that? That's the idea here. And that happens just before Jesus returns to this earth. So this time prophecy that we're looking at is going to give us a hint at when that's going to happen. Now, uh, I'm going to put a graph on the board several times. I hope it was helpful to you last night to see the graph and where the resurrections and so forth. Was that helpful to get a good picture? I'm going to try to do that, the same thing with this. So at the end of the 2,300 days, the sanctuary is cleansed. And Daniel says, when I had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, 
Behold, there stood before me an appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice. This would be somebody else saying, Gabriel, somebody, this would be an angel, likely. Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So uh, that's what I'm going to do tonight, and you do too. Please say amen. You want to understand the vision that Daniel had. And so here we go. We'll read what it says. So he came near where I was standing, and he came, and I was, I was afraid, and I fell upon my face. But he said, understand, O son of man, at the time of the end shall be the vision. And he said, behold, I will make you know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. Indignation means sin. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. And the vision, which was told, is true. Wherefore, shut up the vision, for it shall be for many days. So this is an interesting story. Uh, Daniel is told, right now, you can't be told what it means. And it's a symbol, folks, that people here at the end of the world, very close to the end of the world now, uh, it's finally being revealed to us, just like Daniel had to wait. And it, he was so stricken by this, he got sick. He couldn't stand not knowing. And uh, he said he fainted, and he was sick. But he finally got well. <laughs> he, get up, he got up to do the king's business. And he was still amazed at this vision that he could not understand. He wasn't yet told. Uh, in the first year, Darius, the son of Azuharis, the seed of the Medes, which was made, which made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, I understood, this is Daniel speaking. This is, so he's been around. You know, Daniel came when he was about probably 16, 18 years of age, and he's been there for four kingdoms. It's amazing. A fabulous story. Um, and he's probably uh, 90 now because, I'll show you why, I understood by books, he's talking about Jeremiah, the writings of Jeremiah, which were available to him, the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. You understand, folks, that when uh, Nebuchadnezzar virtually destroyed Jerusalem, took Daniel and all these people on this death march, are you all with me in what I'm talking about? Jeremiah had predicted that they would be there for 70 years before they could go back. That's what he's talking about here. And uh, he says, I understood by books, Jeremiah's book. And he, he's thinking about this, and he's thinking, man, I'm 90. Oh, it's time for us to go back. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. That's the quote from Jeremiah's writing in chapter 25. You can read it in your Bible. So I set my face to the Lord to seek by prayer and supplication, you know, asking. And I was fasting, and I wore some clothes that just show, you know, made out of gunny sacks, I guess you could say. And this, we don't do this today, but folks, that was customary to demonstrate how serious you were about your request that you're making to God. It might not be such a bad idea for us to do that. I mean, you know, put ashes all over you and wear gunny sacks and pray, but we don't do that. But that's what was going on at that time. Uh, and while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin, and the sin of my people. You read this prayer. You can read it in one minute. But he's, Daniel is saying, I've been a sinner too, God, and my people have sinned, and he's pleading with God. You read the prayer. I'm not going to take the time this evening. Uh, and pre presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain. That would be a symbol of Jerusalem. Even Gabriel, boy, that's the highest angel, whom I had seen in the vision earlier, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. That is to say, the evening uh, sacrifice. This would, not be the, this would not be referring to the incense. It's talking about the evening sacrifice. So it's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And Gabriel comes to him. This is pretty, pretty special. And uh, this is what he says to Daniel. Uh, oh, Daniel. I am now come forth to give you skill and understanding. Understanding of what? The vision that uh, he had been sick over not knowing. At the beginning of your prayer, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show, for you are greatly beloved. Oh, folks, listen. That sentence is for every one of us. You are greatly beloved. Amen? What a precious thing. And... Uh, 
Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. And a lot of people like to, to remember this, that uh, Daniel starts to pray, and God says to Gabriel, go down and talk to him. And how long did it take Gabriel to get from heaven to earth? About one minute. Now, he could have done it faster if necessary, but he just wanted to arrive here at the end of his prayer. <clears throat> so here's the vision, 2,300 days, and Daniel is, to, is, to, is going to be explained. Uh, it's going to be explained to him. Now, uh, in Bible prophecy, you know about this. I'd love to spend a lot more time on this question as to why we know this is the case. My church is by no means the only organization that recognized this year for a day principle in Bible prophecy. It's understood by many scholars. I have a friend, he's not a close friend, who wrote a whole book on that one question. Just amazing how, uh, what can be done when you take a lot of time to dig. So instead of 2,300 days, what shall we put there? 2,300 years. And let's keep reading. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. This is, the, this is Gabriel now telling Daniel what the vision means. Seventy weeks are determined upon people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sin, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. In other words, uh, God is giving the Israelites a chance to, if you will, this is too cheap, but to clean up their act, if you will. And uh, seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Uh, to finish the transgression. I'm just listing here now those things that we read to make an end of sin and to make reconciliation for things that we've done that were wrong. Seventy weeks. This word determined means cut off. And so the idea is then in this vision, uh, there are 70 weeks given the Israelites to bring to fruition those things, to to grow in Christ and to, and to stop the transgression and so forth. And it's even a deeper meaning than that. 70 weeks is 490 days. So actually this is going to be what? From uh, a date that we don't have yet, there will be measured 490 years. The Israelite people will have that much time to become the people that God wants them to become in order to take his message to the world. Uh, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah, the prince, seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. So this gives us the date for starting this commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, uh, seven weeks and 60 weeks and uh, two weeks, if you remember what we just read. So... Uh, those are the number of days in seven or 60 or two weeks. And if you add all those days up, you, of 69 weeks, you get 483 days. This is from the, from the commandment to start the prophecy until the Messiah. I'll show you that on the picture. Uh, this is where the commandment uh, started. You can see that arrow to the left. And it's going to be uh, 490 years, but of that, it's going to be 69 weeks until the Messiah. Now, I know this is a lot, folks, but just keep watching the graph, <laughs> and I think uh, it will make reasonable sense to you. So Daniel has been given two time periods there as part of the whole thing. One, uh, how much time the people had to, to become what God wanted them to be, and the other was how soon the Messiah would come. And of course, those days are turned into years, so it's 483 years. The interesting thing, folks, is once we learn the start date, which came from uh, the time for the beginning of the vision, and then this 69-week period, which is part of the 70, 69 weeks, I just said that, until the Messiah appears, uh, and that's just the same verse that said that, so I'm not going to read it. Uh, this is a copy of the letter from Artaxerxes given to Ezra the priest. This is talking about the people still living in Babylon. Ezra was one of them. And the king gives him a letter and lets him go uh, to begin the work. Uh, Ezra the priest, even the scribe, uh, 
and here's the, here's the decree, uh, that the people of Israel in my realm, fourth line, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, take them with you, Ezra. So this is the, rec this is the decree to restore and build Jerusalem. Are you all with me on this? And that's how we know where the prophecy starts. Now, there were several of those decrees. And if you look carefully, uh, if you dig into this, there's good reason for picking this one because it was the effective one. And uh, it was 457 BC. This is well known to historians, this particular thing. So now we know where this starts, 457 BC. And if you take 490 years, is that greater or less than 457? You come to the time uh, during the time of the Messiah, and let me put some additional material on there. 457 plus 490 is 34. That's what I just mentioned on the graph. And uh, so there it is, the uh, 490 years. You can see it at the bottom of the screen. That points to 34 AD. And 27 is when Jesus came on the scene uh, after 483 years. Here's some additional dates, uh, 457 plus 490, I showed that to you, the 34. But another interesting one is to subtract 490 to see how many years are left. Let me show you that on the screen. If you subtract uh, uh, 490 from 200, 300, you get 1810. Are you all with me on what I'm doing? I know you can't go home and repeat this to your friends, folks, but you're getting the point, aren't you? of how this prophecy is being explained to Daniel. And the interesting thing to you and me is, folks, it gives us the time of the end of the world. Not the exact day, but the time of it. And what happens, uh, I do have a pointer here, what happens uh, at the end of this 2,300 years? What happens? What sanctuary is that that's going to be cleansed? The heavenly sanctuary. And when that happens, folks, once it's cleansed, there's no more opportunity for me to say, oh, I got one more sin I want to put up there. Are you all with me on that? It's a very solemn story that we're reading here tonight. So there's the 1,810 years and also uh, from 34 AD, two and a half years, or three and a half years after Christ died, takes us, notice where it takes us. It takes us to 1844. This is very interesting, friends. Uh, I think it was God's plan to come back to this earth, clear back in the last, well, now, more than a century ago. Are you all with me? I think in his mercy, he has, his process of cleansing the sanctuary is still going on. There was a great revival in this country and in other places in the world in the middle, early 40s. Are you aware of that? There was this huge interest, and people everywhere were understanding that Christ was coming soon. It was, it was partly this prophecy, but partly because God wanted it to happen. You get in the historic history books. It was a, especially in America, there was a great movement uh, it's a wonderful story that I don't have time to take tonight and give you the details. But uh, So here's more of this explanation for Daniel. And after the three score and two weeks, shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Notice the three score and two weeks that takes you up to, hit the right button here, To 27, and it says, let me just back up. Um, Unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. And after the three score and two weeks, shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Folks, that's referring to the fact that Jesus died. This is a seven year period, is it not? And he, this is when his ministry began. This is when uh, the gospel was struggling to go to the world right there. And right in the middle, this is exactly when Jesus died. And this, this, the fact that he died there 
as was predicted in the prophecy, is one of the principal reasons that we know that the year for a day principle is valid. Are you all with me on that idea? Two and a half years, uh, three and a half years after that. And he shall confirm, this is uh, Christ, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Jesus, notice these words in white. He causes the sacrifice to cease because his death, friends, was now the issue, not the sacrifice of animals. Are you with me on this? And this is why I think the feasts are no longer required. If you want to observe them, there's usefulness perhaps in that. But I think it's clear that Christ sacrificed closed the, meet, the requirement for those things. So there's his death right in the middle. Prophesied hundreds of years, friends, before. Very, very interesting in helping you have confidence in the validity of the, validity of the scriptures. 31 AD is when he was sacrificed. And at that time, when Jesus died, and listen, do you remember when the morning sacrifice took place? What time? When does the evening sacrifice take place? That's when he died. He died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And when he died, that veil in front of the, of the Ark of the Covenant, which represented God's throne, was torn from top to bottom. When the Israelites made those veils, they would put mules on all four corners and try to tear it apart to make sure it was strong enough. This is not in the Bible. This is Jewish tradition. And uh, this thing was torn from top to bottom. It was way too tall for anybody to get up there even on a ladder. What does it tell you? Who tore that, who tore that thing? An angel or God saw that it was done. And it's indicating, folks, that the work of the Animal sacrifices was now over because the Lamb of God had died in its place. You all with me on this? Very interesting, meaningful, powerful. So there's just a look at the Ark of the Covenant, and you can see the veil right here. Uh, I think in heaven, remember, this thing we've been looking at is a copy of the one in heaven. Is that correct? You know what? It, there's no veil in heaven. The Bible actually says that Jesus is the veil. And the idea there is you have access when you have Jesus Christ. It's an amazing, interesting uh, illustration. Now of the things which we have spoken. This is Hebrews 8. I love this chapter. This is Paul writing. Now of the things of which we have spoken, this is the sum. Okay, folks, here's the conclusion. We have such a high priest who is on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. What's he talking about when he says true tabernacle? The tabernacle in heaven of which this thing we've been talking about is a pattern, which the Lord pitched. Who built that one up there? The Lord did. Who built the one in the wilderness? Men did. Men and women uh, built that, which the Lord pitched and not man. Then truly the first covenant had also ordinance of, ordinances of divine service and an earthly or worldly sanctuary. What one is he referring to now? The one the Israelites built. Are you all with me? And, and it, had, it had services, divine services. It had ordinances, as we've described. For there was a tabernacle made. Now he's talking about the one the Israelites made. The first room is what he means, where the candlestick and the table and the showbread were. That's called the sanctuary. And in the second room, after the second veil, you remember, folks, that uh, there's a veil out here, right? Everybody? And there's a veil there in front of the Ark of the Covenant. That's what he's talking about, the second veil. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So he's using the word tabernacle for e each room is a tabernacle, if you will. Uh, which had the golden censer, I didn't picture that, and the Ark of the Covenant covered with gold, where was, wherein was three things, Aaron's pot, 
uh, I'm sorry, a pot of uh, manna. That's the food that God rained down every day out there in the wilderness. And by the way, if you tried to keep it from, from Monday to Tuesday and, and, and use some of it then, what happened? It got, it got rotten. On Friday, you were supposed to get twice as much so you wouldn't have to gather on the Sabbath. And so on Friday, when you kept some over for the next day, did it get rotten? It's an amazing story, folks, uh, showing you how God planned for people to have a day of rest, which most of the world has lost. Um, the, the golden pot that had men, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. We actually read this text the other night, you may remember. And over that box, that chest, the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat. Well, isn't that a wonderful name for God's throne? What's it called? Because he's a God of mercy. Oh, I love that, folks. Where would I be? Where would you be without his mercy? So the artist has pulled the curtain back, and you can see the high priest there. He's the only one that could put incense on that altar, right? And there he is doing that. You can see the table and the candlestick. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. That is to say, not the incense, but taking the blood in there from somebody that came repenting with their lamb, and he put the blood on the, on the curtain and on the altar of incense, as we see there. But into the second, what does he mean by the second? The most holy place went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood. I didn't mention this to you, but he took blood into the presence of God. I mentioned this, that he would put some there uh, on the chest. Now, he offered that for himself. Is the high priest a sinner? Sure. And for the errors of the people there in the most holy place. The Holy Ghost, this signifying, you know, what does this mean, him doing that? That the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. During the time of the Israelites, according to Paul, people did not fully grasp what it meant to have this service. The implication, folks, is that you and I can grasp something much deeper even than I've been speaking of so far in terms of the way the Israelites carried on this worship service. Which was a figure then in which were offered gifts and sacrifices, watch this, that could not make him that did the service perfect, I'm going to say forgiven. There are four places right in this portion of the book of Hebrews where it keeps saying, the blood of those animals did not forgive sin. Are you all with me on this? It was a symbol that the people didn't fully understand. But you and I can have a deeper understanding today that it is Christ's blood. It could not make, this animal blood could not make him that did the surface forgiven. That's what that means. Those things stood in meats and drinks and different kinds of washings, carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. These things, folks, are not required of Christians today. That's what that's saying. Once Christ has died. This is another reason why I think the idea of keeping the feast, God is not requiring that. You all with me on this idea? But Christ... He's a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, not like this one. What is it, what's he talking about? The tabernacle in heaven. I love these chapters in Hebrews. Neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his blood, he entered one time, and actually that should say into the holy places, both of them, having obtained eternal redemption for us. I'd love to talk to you about the Greek all through this section, which has been understood by some people, but just my reference was correct. Uh, he, he, as it were, he went into both places in the heavenly sanctuary. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding blood, there's what? 
Without Christ's shed blood, folks, we could not be forgiven. We all understand that. He's just repeating that beautiful truth. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens, that is to say the earthly sanctuary, should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves, see, this, this lamb is purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Amen? Or with a better sacrifice would be the proper translation. Nor yet that he, this is Christ, should offer himself often, like the high priest did every year, with blood of others, that is to say the blood of the animals. For then must he, who's this he? This is Christ. He would have had to suffer uh, often from the foundation of the world. So the lambs typified this, but Christ had to only do it what? Once. That's what this ver these verses are talking about. But now once in the end of time, into the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And there he is, is as it were, if our high priest uh, forgiving us because of, of, of giving his life. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. And now we're back to Daniel. And I think I should quit because I'm 11 minutes past already. But it's essentially at the end, folks, understanding that uh, it was God's plan to come very close to 1844. We believe that he began at that time, didn't finish the work of cleansing the sanctuary. He is looking through the books to see if people had confessed every sin and stood by day by day, letting God forgive them until they died. So when he looks in my book, let's say I, let's say I die tonight. Please don't say that, but let's say I die tonight. Um, I pray that uh, in my mind, folks, it should be there all the time. When I make a mistake, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Amen? So that when I die, folks, the book shows that I was a forgiven person. I believe that that work of judgment is taking place now. And God is delaying his coming because he wants to save as many people as he can. So may there not be one person here this evening that doesn't say, okay, Lord, please follow me, friends. I want to do what you want me to do. I realize, folks, I've been teaching some things here this week that are different from what Protestant churches understand. I hope you see, folks, it has been from the word of God. Amen? This is not something that somebody has made up. And you understand how much I love the people in those churches, but I want them. In fact, in Revelation chapter 8, uh, chapter... 15, it says, yeah, chapter 15, it says, come out of her, my people. And her is that woman that's riding the dragon that is a whore. God represents his people when they do wrong as being prostitutes. They're married to him, and when they do wrong, they have prostituted. Y'all with me on the idea? So that woman, which represents the worldly church, which does not teach the truth, but is, is filled with God's people. Are y'all with me on this? And the call is to come out and follow the Bible truth that you folks have learned here this weekend. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, Lord, you're... Your plan is marvelous. We thank you. We praise your name. I pray your blessing, Lord, on every person in this room. That they would surrender to you and, and see your plan and see your truth and determine to be part of that people, Lord. Bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.